Okay, um, in our study of the history of the Bible, we're going to look at uh, some more contradictions this evening, or supposed contradictions in the Bible. And then on Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll look at some just some odds and ends, and take a look at the new King James Version, falsely so-called. And uh, I don't know, I just... I, I feel like we've spent months on this and that I've cheated you by just being so shallow, but uh, there's so much excitement among those that want to know and so much murmuring among those who say they already know all this stuff and yet they don't know, uh, if they know it all, they're not passing it on to anybody. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not enough to say my preacher believes in the deity of Christ and so I do. Um, you got to be able to take the Bible and prove to somebody that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And I'm glad you believe the King James Bible, so do I. But I'd sure like to be able to show somebody why I believe it and be able to back that up and be able to, to support that belief. And um, so that's what we've been trying to do. And what we'll do either uh, Sunday night, if we have time, or uh, Thursday night, I will go over for you the materials uh, that I have in, in my library that are available to you. Uh, if you want to purchase them for yourself, where you can go into any of these uh, particulars that we've covered in in more detail, and I would encourage you to do that because there's just uh, there's so much here, and and uh, I find it interesting, and I believe many of you have as well. I have before me, if you weren't with us when we covered this last time, I have a list of uh, that I've collected over the years of 120 supposed contradictions in the Bible that people have sent to me, uh, thinking that. I was going to read them and then say, well, hallelujah, glory to God, I don't believe the Bible anymore. Uh, I'm so happy now to be free from my faith in the Word of God. And yet I find as I read and study these contradictions, two things are true. Number one, I know that the people who sent them did not find them on their own as a result of their reading and Bible study. And the reason I know that is no one who doubts the authority of the Word of God, and disbelieves the Word of God, is reading Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles carefully enough to note the difference in the numbers of horses and horsemen and chariots from Samuel to Kings to Chronicles. People that don't believe the Bible aren't reading their Bible that carefully. Uh, when somebody sends you a, a, a contradiction in the Bible and says, well, look here, the, the total number of people in this tribe in the book of Numbers differs from the total number of people in this tribe in, in the record in First Chronicles, you know they got that out of a book or they got it from some infidel because nobody that doesn't believe the Bible is digging into Numbers and the genealogies in First Chronicles. In fact, people that do believe the Bible aren't digging into Numbers and, and the genealogies in First Chronicles. And then when you, when you sit down and look at these earth-shattering, faith-destroying contradictions, you know that either the person who sent them to you didn't read them, or their problem is not a wrong Bible translation. Their problem is they got a social promotion from second grade to third grade. And had it not been a social promotion, they'd still be in the second grade. Because the problem in every one of these cases is somebody just doesn't know how to read. And I don't, you know, so well, you sound kind of mean-spirited about that. Uh, these people are trying to get you to disbelieve the Word of God. And you ought to get upset about that. Uh, some people get mad when, they're ru- when their favorite team's running back fumbles. I can't believe he did that! Okay, well, that's how I feel when somebody who claims to be saved tries to get somebody who is saved to stop believing the Bible. I feel that way. I think this is important. And so it it does annoy and aggravate me to see God's people uh, toyed with in this manner. For example, 1 Kings chapter 7 in one hand and 2 Chronicles chapter 4 in the other. 1 Kings 7... In 2 Chronicles chapter number 4, I got a book in the library called Deceptions and Myths of the Bible. It's about uh, 300 and some pages. And then there's Asimov's Guide to the Bible, a science fiction writer who in his spare time tried to find reasons to not believe the Bible. 
Uh, these guys are nuts. For example, they say the children of Israel didn't pass through the Red Sea. They passed through the Reed Sea, and the water was only three inches deep, and they just waded through, which made it pretty tough for the Egyptian army to drown. But they did. Boy, when those three inches of water came crashing in on those chariots, it was, it was all they could handle. They said that Jesus didn't walk on the water. He walked on chunks of ice that were floating in the Sea of Galilee. And you know, personally, when I read the account of the, of the storm that was so great that commercial fishermen thought they were going to drown, to me it's more impressive if he, if he was walking from chunk to chunk of ice than if he was walking on the water itself. You try it in a hurricane sometime. Just go out in the middle of the ocean in an in 80 mile an hour wind and, and put three or four little uh, styrofoam surfboards out there and just walk on them. See, see how far you get. So... These guys, you know, they, they, don't, they don't think. But here we go. 1 Kings 7, verse 23. They're building the, the uh, furniture and the ornaments to go in the temple. And the Bible says in verse 23, He made a molten sea ten cubits from the one brim to the other. So across is ten cubits. Cubits, 18 inches, about 180 uh, inches across from, from brim to brim. It was round all about. The height was five cubits. So... Cubits 18 inches, that'd be about uh, seven and a half feet high, something like that. And a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. And under the brim of it were, uh, round about, there were knops compassing it, ten in a cubit, compassing the sea round about. The knops were cast in two rows when it was cast. Uh, it stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three toward the west, three toward the south, three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above them, and all their hinder parts were inward. So they're like the legs. you got this big, this big bowl, seven and a half feet high, and the legs of that bowl has 12 legs, and they're in the shape of, of, uh, of oxen here, and there's three on, on each side facing out, and that big bowl or big bathtub thing is sitting down uh, right on top of them. And then the Bible says in verse number 26, and it was a hand bread thick, and the brim there was wrought like the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies. It contained 2,000 baths. Now, keeping your finger right there, Second Chronicles chapter 4 and verse number 2. Also, he made a molten sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. And under it was the similitude of oxen, which did compass it around about, ten and a cubit, compassing the sea round about. Two rows of oxen were cast when it was cast. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their inward parts were inward, or hinder parts were inward. And the thickness of it was in hand breadth, and the brim of it like the work of the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies. And it received and held... 3,000 baths. Now, this is the point I was trying to make. How many people do you know that believe an RSV and a living Bible are better than a King James? We're reading along one night in Second Chronicles 4, and suddenly the man set down his good news for modern man and said, Wait a minute. I don't think that matches what I read about the molten sea back in 1 Kings chapter 7. I'm not buying it. Whoever sent me this contradiction got it out of a book. And it wasn't the Bible. Now let's take a look. In chapter 4 and verse number 5, look at the end of the verse. It held 3,000 baths. Now, I don't know if that's enough water for 3,000 people to take a bath. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that measurement is. If it's a pint, if it's a gallon, what, but it would hold 3,000 baths. 1 Kings chapter 7 and verse number 26 says, It contained 2,000 baths. That's supposed to be a contradiction. And so Lillian says to me, she said it's going to turn cold. Would you go out and check the tank and see if we got any, any gas in the tank? 
So I go outside and I look at that tank, and that tank will receive and hold 100 gallons. And I lift the lid and I look at the little dial and I says it contain. I say it contains 60 gallons. That's not a contradiction. That's just life as we know it. This big bowl thing, and I don't know why God had him build a great big bathtub in the doorway of the temple sitting on 12 oxen, other than he wants people to know he wants them clean when they go in there, and he wants them to know it so he makes a seven and a half foot high bathtub so they couldn't miss it. I want you clean, you got it? <laughs> now, how many baths, how, how much water would that thing hold? It hold 3,000 baths. How many did it contain? It contained 2,000. That's only a contradiction in the mind of somebody who shouldn't be handling the Bible anyway. They should be sitting and rocking and letting someone read it to them. Amen. Now that's supposed to make you want to put your Bible down. Not me. Not me. Second Samuel chapter 24 and First Chronicles chapter 21. Now here's a case of an insincere and careless student. And I appreciate this group of people. I admire you and appreciate you. I appreciate the fact that you read your own Bible, think for yourself, study for yourself. And if you'll do that, most of the time you don't need Brother James to answer your questions for you. You can get the answers yourself. When somebody sends me a, a, a note and says... Uh, 2 Samuel 24, 9 gives the total population of Israel as 800,000. 1 Chronicles 21, 5 says it was 1.1 million. What am I to do with this? I'm, I'm tempted to write back and say, you're to study it. <laughs> Look it up. For example, let's read it. 2 Samuel 24, verse 9. And Joab gave the psalm of the number of the people under the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Okay, now keep the place. First Chronicles 21 and verse number 5. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword. That's 1.1 million men. Jude was 400, three score, and 10,000 men that drew the sword. So, here's what I've got. In 24.9, I've got 800,000. In 1 Chronicles 21.5, I've got 1.1 million. A discrepancy of 300,000 men. Notice the word in Samuel that does not occur in Chronicles. Verse number 9, there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. Valiant. If you take the... Well, okay, so first of all, I say to myself, self, obviously there's 300,000 men who were not valiant. That's simple enough. But then I want to know, are they cowards? Why, why, does, why does Joab, who certainly wasn't a coward, why does Joab have 300,000 men in his army that are chickens? Ah, but if you take two minutes, that's all it takes to look it up in the dictionary. One minute for Stephen to go get it. One minute for me to turn and read it. The third, the third definition of the word valiant is as follows. Having performed with valor, having bravely conducted oneself. You know what you got? You got 800,000 veterans and 300,000 men who have not yet been in combat. So you have 800, how many men you got, Joab? I got 800,000 proven men. Valiant man who have been in the wars of the Lord and fought, and I got 300,000 over here that haven't yet seen any action. I got 1.1 million, 800,000 of them are valiant. That's how a general would report to his king. 
That's the Bible. Not a problem with the Bible. Just take the time to work it out. Second Samuel 24 and First Chronicles 21. David's going to get in trouble for numbering the people here. The Lord didn't like it. Because the only reason he's counting is to find out if he's got enough. Now in the New Testament, a man is told not to go to battle until he counts and makes sure he's got enough soldiers to finish the job. But in the Old Testament, that king of Israel, he was told, I want you to depend entirely upon the Lord. I don't want you to number the soldiers. I don't want you to count the men. I just want you to go out there and fight. If it's just you and me, you can win. Jonathan found that out. Sennacherib and his bunch, they found that out. Moses found that out. So the Lord said, man, don't, don't number your troops. Just go out there and fight. But David did. He got in trouble for it. And so, uh, verse number 10, David's heart, and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. Now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad by uh, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Now, that's, that's important that you get a hold of that. David was confronted with his sin. He acknowledged his sin. He repented of his sin. And he told God he was sorry. God said, Okay, fine, I'll put your sin away. Now, how would you like to reap it? You know, it's great to tell God you're sorry, and you should. It's great to repent and turn from your sin, and you should. But please don't make the mistake of thinking that's the end of the matter. You'll you'll reap. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. What sort of man soweth, that shall also reap. They that sow the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. They that sow the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. That's New Testament, well as old. So David says, God, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have done it. I repent. The Lord says, okay, fine. I forgive you. Now, how would you like to... Settle up. <laughs> and and in, in saying this, verse 13, Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. All right, First Chronicles 21. Same situation. First Chronicles 21 and verse number 12. Gad came to David in verse 11, said, Either three years famine, semicolon, or three months be destroyed before thy foes, while the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now, first of all, it's obvious that you have two different statements made by Gad to David in this situation. Now, here, here's what you can do. I got, I got a copy here of a book on, that supposedly answers the contradictions in the Bible. And the answer to the, the one that we just did about the, 800,000 verse 1.1 million. It says, Obviously, the one transcribing this passage misunderstood the author's intent. Either he was not listening carefully when it was dictated, or he was not looking carefully when he copied the numbers and simply wrote down the wrong number in one of two places. We're not sure which. Archer says in the former, Light of Life says in the latter. Under this one it says, um, uh, the, the scribe who took down the historical record misunderstood the wording. Okay, let's get real life here, okay? You're David the king. The prophets just come in and said, David, you really messed up, you shouldn't have numbered the people. David's heart smites him, he repents before the Lord. Gad says, okay, here's your three choices, David, and gives them to him. And David says just what you would say. Man, I gotta think about that. You can, Gad, you gotta give me a minute here. I, uh, hang on a second. David walks the floor a little while, maybe a long while, comes back, says, now Gad, look, I, 
This is tough, man. What, give me that again. Now, wouldn't you rather look at the Word of God in light of real life than take something this simple and throw out your faith in the Bible? But it's easier than that. David's choice, the, the first choice, is twofold. He can, in the Chronicles passage, take a look at it, First Chronicles 21, verse 12, he can have three years famine, semicolon. That's general, he's the king, it's on the land. Or, Second Samuel 24, and verse number 13, look at the specific. Shall seven years famine come unto thee in thy land? So you can have three years famine on the land. Or you personally can have seven years famine in the land. That's the option. You got a twofold option on the first of the three options. So I'm not buying that. Really? Go, go buy something tomorrow, okay? Just go somewhere tomorrow and talk to a salesman. He'll give you three options on that phone deal. And if you still had not made up your mind, he'll give you a second option on the first option. Now, why would, you, why would you know that that's so just about every day of your life in the real world and not allow for it to be so in the everyday lives of people in Bible times? See, that's, that's all that's going on. Man's dealing with David and uh, David's in a jam. Second Chronicles, uh, Chronicles 36 and Second Kings 24. Now what's good about these um, is you don't have to remember this because if you faithfully witness for the Lord every day till Jesus comes, you probably never have anybody ask you about these passages. The only reason I'm going through these is so that, so that in your heart and mind you know when somebody who's supposed to love God and be a Christian says to you, Oh, the King James Bible, that's so full of contradictions. You'll know that that man is not to be given a, a credible hearing. Okay? It's not full of contradictions. Somebody told that guy it was full of contradictions, and he didn't care enough about it to look it up. Second Kings 24, verse 8 says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 36 and verse number 9. Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So one passage says three months, one passage says three months and ten days. Now, I want you to be honest with me. Some even saved a long time. Is there anybody here that ever noticed, as you read through Kings and Chronicles, the ten days in Chronicles that were not there in Kings? Just anybody Okay, and this is the crowd that reads and believes the Bible, I hope, um, allegedly. I'm just not buying that somebody's reading through a King James Bible. Listen, somebody that doesn't believe a King James Bible is reading through their King James Bible and says, Whoa, Nelly! Look at those ten days there. That's it. I'm going NIV. <laughs> now, can, you understand, when somebody says there's contradictions in the Bible, they're just repeating what somebody as dumb as they are told them. They didn't get that from any study of the Word. Now, question. Who was President of the United States in 1992? Anybody know? Bill Clinton. Who was President of the United States in 2000? 2001, George Bush, would, 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 anybody, would anybody say, no, he was not, you're wrong. Bill Clinton was President of the United States in 1992. 
But he was only president for 345 days. He didn't become president until January the 20th. But nobody would find fault with a history book or a textbook or a magazine article or a newspaper article that said Bill Clinton was president in 1992 because he was. Now the fact that 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 uh, King George I was president for 20 days of 1992, when they list him as president, they're going to say he was president from 87 to 91. But he's president for 20 days in 92. He don't get any credit for. Bill Clinton's president from 92 to 2000. He's president for 20 days in 2001, but he doesn't get any credit for it unless somebody wants to be real technical and real specific like the man who is chronicling the reigns of the kings. He's going to get it exact. He's going to give the guy the other ten days. Now, if you'd allow that... Now, if your professor allows that in the textbook he made you pay $130 for in that college class, he's a hypocrite to not allow it in the Bible. Just, just, He's just a hypocrite. That's all he is. All right, zipping right along. Second Samuel 8 and First Chronicles 18. In fact, we need a bunch of verses here. How many hands do you have? Sure got cheated in that evolution, didn't you? You've only got two left you can use for anything. Second Samuel 8, First Chronicles 18. I don't like this King James stuff. I like preaching better. About three months ago, you were complaining about the preaching. <laughs> but you know, it's easy to say, I love the Bible. It's easy to say, I love the Word of God. Do you love Samuel? Do you love Kings? Do you love Chronicles? Love Ezra and Nehemiah? Do you love Numbers? It's all God's Word. It's all... All good. Every word of God is pure. First Chronicles 18, um, 2 Samuel 8, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. I'm going to do four all at once here. 2 Chronicles 9 and 1 Kings chapter 4. Don't you suppose God intended some of these things to be in here just to find out if who loved darkness and who loved light? Who's looking for a reason to reject the Word and who's looking for a reason to believe it? Wouldn't you hate to get to heaven and stand before the holy God of Israel and say that you didn't read the Bible anymore because somebody told you that in one place it said a king reigned three months, and the other place he reigned three months and ten days, and God said, okay, smart fella, name him. And you couldn't even give the name of the king. And the Lord said, okay, I'll make it easy on you. Was he Israel or Judah? Uh, get him out of here. Get him out of here. Is, is that fair enough? I'm tired of these guys telling me I shouldn't believe the Bible just because they don't believe it. Give me a reason not to or leave me alone. Second Samuel 8 with First Chronicles 18. Here's, here's the, the bugaboo. Second Chronicles, or Second Samuel 8 verse 4. David took from him, that's from Hadad Ezer, the son of Rehob. He was king of Zobah, by the way. David took from him a thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 footmen. And David hawked all the chariot horses, but reserved them for a hundred chariots. He hawked those horses. You ever have a ham hock? That's what it is. He just sliced that tendon in their legs so they couldn't run anymore. So here's what we got in Samuel. We have 1,000 chariots, we have 700 horsemen, and we have 20,000 footmen. Okay? First 
Chronicles 18, First Chronicles 18, and verse number 4. David took from him, that'd be Hadad Rezer, king of Zobah. David took from him a thousand chariots, seven thousand horsemen, and twenty thousand footmen. David also hawked all the chariot horses. So he's got thousand chariots, seven thousand, and twenty thousand. Now, you know exactly what all the commentators say. It's just so easy to get one more zero in there when you're copying the Bible late at night and you're just about out of coffee. First Kings chapter 4. You don't know why I'd rather believe the Bible? So I don't have to read stuff like this. This is Kyle and Delich. They're supposed to be the geniuses on the Old Testament. Kyle and Delich, page 360. The word for charitry, recab, was inadvertently omitted by the scribe in copying 2 Samuel 8, 4, and the second figure, 7,000, for the parism, Calvaryman, was necessarily reduced from seven to seven hundred from the seven thousand he saw in his vorlage for the simple reason that no one would write seven thousand after he'd written one thousand in the reading and the recording the one and the same figure. The omission of recab might have occurred in an earlier scribe, and a reduction from seven thousand to seven hundred would have then continued with the successive copies by later scribe. But in all probability, the chronicles figure is right, and the Samuel numbers should be corrected to agree with that based on based on they figured a guy you know what he said a guy wrote a thousand by mistake and there was no way to go back and make a thousand seven hundred so he just made the one into a seven and left it at seven thousand that's that's a Hebrew a pair of Hebrew scholars that's the kind of respect they have for the word of God if you'll get that tape that we put on the back table on the preservation of the Hebrew text, you know what a scribe would do if he wrote 1,000 and then when he was proofreading saw it was supposed to be 700? He'd burn everything he wrote and start over again. That's what he'd do. All right, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. 40,000 stalls for his horses. I've seen some of those stalls. They're preserved to this day on the top of a hill in, in Megiddo. Solomon had his, had his chariot horses and his cavalry stationed in the valley of Megiddo on a hill called Armageddon. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Second Chronicles chapter 9. Second Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 25. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. So we got a double contradiction here. We got four thousand and forty thousand. We got seven hundred and seven thousand. Second Samuel ten and First Chronicles nineteen. Second Samuel chapter ten. We say midweek Bible study, we mean it. First Chronicles nineteen. Okay, Second Samuel 10, verse 18. The Syrians fled before Israel. 
And David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen and smote Shobach, the captain of their host, who died there. He slew the men of 700 chariots. First Chronicles chapter 19. And verse number 18. But the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Okay, take a look. How many men did he kill? 7,000 men who fought in chariots. How many men did he kill? He killed the men of 700 chariots. You know what you got? You got 10 men to a chariot. That's what you've got here, and that's what you've got here. And there's no contradiction in the Bible at all. Somebody, somebody's trying to get you to look at these two verses over here and throw your Bible away instead of looking at these two verses over here that would make you say, Glory to God, hallelujah, what a book. Second Chronicles 2, 1 Kings 5. You notice they're not giving you any contradiction between Galatians 4 and Romans 3? You know the... This kind of stuff isn't going to get you to heaven. It's not going to put you in hell. Why is a guy rejecting the gospel of John on the basis of numbers of men in chariots? Think about that. Second Chronicles 2 and 1 Kings chapter 5. This one's, this one's cinchy as they used to say when I was in grade school. That one-room schoolhouse with no electricity that we walked five miles to get to. Both ways uphill. Yeah, uphill both ways. All right, Second Chronicles 2. Boys and girls, try this one on your own. You ready? Verse 2, Second Chronicles 2, 2. And Solomon told out... Three score and ten thousand men, that would be seventy thousand men, to bear burdens, and four score thousand, eighty thousand, to hew in the mountain, and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. First Kings chapter five. Verse sixteen, start in the middle of the verse. 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. I'm embarrassed to even tell you that somebody had a problem with this. Now let's read the first half of the verse, which is supposed to be the contradiction. Beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. Now, 2 Chronicles 2, 2 says there were 3,600 overseers. You're supposed to believe that there's a problem with the King's passage saying there were 3,300 overseers. But that's 3,300 besides the chief overseers. You know what that means? That means you had 150,000 men working, 3,300 men watching them work, and 300 sitting in an office collecting the fees and, uh, and so forth from the people who were having the work done. Is that so hard to understand? If it's not, just drive by any job site. There's six guys working. There's two guys watching them work, and there's one guy in an office down here in the county administration building collecting the fees. 
That's the way it gets done. That's the way it's always gotten done. It's not a contradiction in the Bible. Now, take a look at this one. You guys, how many of you guys are military? Been, been, okay. This, you can just go ahead and laugh at this. Joshua 10 and Joshua 15. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 15. This is supposed to make me pick up an amplified. Joshua 10, verse 23. Or um, 22. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. They did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Ebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, And the king of Eglon, verse number 40. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings, all their kings, he left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. Where did he do that? In the hills, in the south, in the vale, in the springs. That's in the battle during which he captured the king of Jerusalem. Joshua 15, verse 63. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. The contradiction is supposed to be that In chapter 10, they took Jerusalem, but in chapter 15, the Jebusites were still living there and they couldn't drive them out. Have you read anything lately about Baghdad? Hasn't our army taken Baghdad? Aren't there some people there that we can't drive out? Why would anybody who... who, rushes home from work to watch the nightly news, not believe a King James Bible. Incredible. Now, I'll show you one more alleged contradiction tonight, and then I'll show you a real one. But we'll have to use the NIV to see a real one. Those of you that brought your NIVs tonight, you'll finally get your money's worth. Okay, Genesis 12, verse number 4. You have three periods of time in your Bible. The Bible says from the promise made to Abraham to the giving of the law, was 490 years. And from the giving of the law to the building of the temple was 490 years. And the building of the temple to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince being cut off, was 490 years. So you have one, two, three periods of 490 years. And the problem is, they weren't. They weren't 490 years. But God said they were. Genesis chapter 12. Then we'll we'll set a date for the second coming. How about that? Genesis 12 verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now Galatians chapter 3 and verse 17. Galatians chapter 3.
verse 17. Sixteen, not Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not of the seeds as of many, but as of one, thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Seventy-five years and 430 years gives you 505 years. Come back to Genesis. Chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And verse number 3. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Verse 16. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Chapter 21, verse 5. And Abram was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Abraham, or Abram, is out of God's will, that matter of Hagar, for 15 years. You know what God calls a time period? Touching Abraham? 490 years, when the, when the promised people are out of the will of God, God stops the clock. 505 years in man's time, it's only 490 years in God's time. God's not keeping time when His chosen people are out of His will. He stops the clock. Okay, Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. And verse 18. Paul stood up, verse 16. Verse 17. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill my will. So I got 40 years in the wilderness. I've got 450 years from Joshua to Samuel. I got 20 years for Samuel, 40 years for Saul, 40 years for David. Samuel, Saul, David. So on man's calendar, we got 591 years from the law to the temple. And yet God said it was 591 years. Strange business.
Judges 3, 11 years in servitude. Or, or 8 years, I'm sorry, in Mesopotamia, in Judges 3. Judges 3. Where's that? Because you've got an overlap here in each of these. This Exodus date and this date when David turns the kingdom over to Saul, they, they overlap. Okay, in Judges 3, I've got 18 years of servitude to Moab. Judges 4, I've got 20 years of servitude to the Canaanites. Judges 6, 7 years of servitude to the Moabites. Judges 10, 18 years of servitude to the Philistines. Judges 13, you've got 40 years of servitude to the Philistines. 111 years. You've got three years, or seven years in building the temple, three years from the building to the dedication. That's another ten years that are, that are in this time period over here. But I've got 111 years of servitude in the book of Judges. That's going to give you 480. Seven years to build the temple, three years from the building to the dedication. 490 years. Man's reckoning, it's 591 years from the law to the temple. God's reckoning, it's 490 years from the law to the temple because when God's chosen people are out of His will, He turns off the clock. It's not running. He doesn't keep time. Okay, I can give you this. After a while, we need the space here from the temple to the Messiah. Artaxerxes gives an uh, edict in Nehemiah chapter 2 to rebuild the temple. And from the edict of Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple... To the time Messiah the Prince was cut off, 560 years. And during that time, the Jews spent how long in Babylonian captivity? 70 years in Babylon, which gives you 490 years. God gave you three time periods that have to do with the way He keeps time. Not the way you keep time. Not the way man keeps time. Now, let's set a date for the rapture of the second coming. It's easy to do. Messiah the Prince was cut off in the midst of that last week of years. There are seven years left on God's calendar. You've got to finish this block of years right here. That's why the Old Testament proves the church is not going one day into the tribulation. It has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with the nation of Israel. There's seven years left to complete these blocks of years. So, when Messiah the Prince is cut off at Calvary, from that point to the second coming of Jesus Christ to set up His kingdom is exactly seven years. That's why every Bible writer and everybody that's believed the Bible since has always lived their life in anticipation of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been seven years from the second coming since the day Jesus died on the cross. Now, I don't want to disappoint you, 
But you got, but you know, you want to block off and say, well, you know, the Lord's coming soon because a generation will not pass and, and you know, the thousand years is a day. And, okay, okay, how about this? In 70 AD, the Jews lost Jerusalem. Okay? They got it back in 1973 AD. I believe that was Hal Lindsey's first date for the rapture, is 1973. The Jews got Jerusalem back. So that means that for 1,903 years, the clock wasn't running. So if you're going to date the second coming by saying it's 2,000 years from the first coming to the second coming, don't sell your property. And don't give your money to a preacher who says he knows the date of the rapture. It may be a good long ways off. You say, Brother James, you think the Lord's coming soon? I sure do. It's, 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 bound, to be, it's bound to be within seven years. Within seven years of his crucifixion is going to be his second coming. But that's on God's calendar. And God's calendar has to do with the Jew and Jerusalem. It does not have to do with the New Testament church. Okay, real quick, real quick. I know we're in over time, but that's because Kirk and Russ took up so much time tonight. Uh, I want you to get <laughs> First Samuel 17... And 2 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 17 and 2 Samuel 21. I want everybody in Sister Lillian's class, Sister Nora's class, to stand up, please, just for a minute. Quickly, quickly. All right. These are our five to eight-year-olds. I want you to tell me who killed Goliath. If you, if you think David, raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's see if you're right. Have a seat. First Samuel 17 and verse number 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. That means he's real tall. And David whipped him, didn't he? The Bible says all the way down in uh, verse number 49, David put his hand in his bag, took a of stone and slang it. <laughs> I like that. David used slang. And smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead. And he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And smote the Philistine and slew him. Now, you know what the NIV says in verse 50? So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Uh, without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now, Second Samuel, chapter 21, and verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines. The people who lived there were referred to as goblins, yeah. All right, there's again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where El Hanan, the son of Jeroragon, or, yeah, that's, that's good enough. A Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Goliath had how many brothers? Anybody know? Four. He had four brothers. There's five of them all together. That's why David took how many stones down at the brook? He took five stones. You've got to take a whole bunch out if he had to. And later these four were killed. So, so Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite. 
But if you got a new international version, that's not so. Listen to this. Verse number 20, or 19, I'm sorry. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, the son of Jair Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. So if you got an NIV, poor Goliath got killed twice. David killed him, cut off his head, and then some years later, the headless Goliath was slain by Elhanan. Now, you know what that is? That's a contradiction. But fortunately, it's not in the Bible. It's in the NIV. And there's a, there's a big difference. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, help us to love it, to believe it, to search it, to study it, not to let men talk us out of our faith in your perfect word. We thank you, Father, for giving us your Bible. Thank you for loving us and caring for us enough to give us your words that we might have them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.